There we go. Found the button. Uh, I'm going to share a word with you this morning on favoritism. And uh, when I think about favoritism, I want to uh, kind of define it with you and different things. And uh, we're going to look in James, I think it's chapter 3. We're going to look in Exodus. We're going to look around Leviticus. I think it's 15, 12, something like that. We're just going to kind of touch around some different scriptures on the subject of favoritism. Because I think in our culture, in America today, there, there is favoritism that goes on. And it, it comes in different forms and different fashions, and especially when it comes to race and racial issues, I think you see favoritism played out it's in certain ways at certain times. And we're going to kind of talk about some subjects today that may be difficult. They may be hard subjects. They may be, may be challenge some thoughts that you may have. And, uh, and that's okay. I like, to, uh, I like to deal with difficult issues. I like to deal with difficult subjects because uh, I'm interested in those things, the things that are just kind of boring and blasé that we could talk about. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't know. That doesn't do much for me. I like to get into some controversial thoughts. I like to deal with some polarizing subjects. And so that's what I'm going to do. And uh, I, uh, I want to talk to you about the subject of favoritism. But uh, when, we, when we talk about favoritism, how many of you have ever uh, felt like someone played favorites against you? Have you ever felt that way? How many of you have ever felt like someone played favorites for you? Okay. So which, which time is it right? Neither time, right? Neither time is it right. But sometimes when it's for us, we think, well, that's not so bad. You know, it's not nearly as bad as when it's against you. You know, when, when, you're, when you're treated unjustly and someone else receives some kind of favoritism because of an unjust reason, uh, man, that, that can really rub you the wrong way. That can really be upsetting, make, make you angry. And uh, so, but, but in, and when we define favoritism, I, I, I really don't think, uh, let's say there's one position in a, in a company and there are 100 applicants, only one person's going to get the job. What are the criteria that should be used to employ that person? Well, to me, the way I think, and again, my thinking may be not normal or whatever, but in my mind, the criteria should be who is the best person for the job, period. I, I don't care if they're anything else about them, if it was left up to me. Uh, but again, uh, that's, just, that's just my crazy thinking. So let's talk about favoritism. What is it? Uh, using inappropriate criteria to give favor to one person over another. We're going to talk about four different types of favoritism that I found in the Bible. And uh, we're going to be talking about judicial favoritism, which would mean in a court of law. Obviously, in a court of law, that's a very uh, serious time. It's a serious moment, and you don't want any favoritism going on there. You want everything to be above board. We're going to talk about financial favoritism from James chapter 2. We're going to talk about, ask the question, does God show favoritism? We're going to we're going to deal with that subject, and then we'll conclude with racial favoritism, which is so prominent in our news today, and how does that, uh, how does that pan out and affect our lives. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I ask you to turn to Exodus chapter 23. We're going to talk about this first form of favoritism in uh, Exodus 23, and uh, we're given some very clear instructions, not really left up to interpretation. The Bible just tells you what to do and what not to do sometimes. That's kind of nice. Do this, don't do this. Just keep it, keep it plain. So in verse 1, the Bible tells us in regard to judici the judicial favoritism did not spread false reports helping the guilty. Do not spread false reports helping the guilty. Why would anyone do such a thing? Why would anyone want to spread a false report to help someone who was guilty? It may be my friend, somebody said in the congregation. It may be a family member. It may be a friend. You may, you may identify with that person in some, for some reason from something from your past, and because of that, you think you should, or it's the right thing to swing the balances in the other direction, perhaps, on this, on this case. Uh, lots of different reasons people might spread false reports trying to help the guilty. The next thing the scripture says here in verse 2 of Exodus 23 is do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. I read this and I thought, well, why would someone follow the crowd? Well, I mean, the crowd is powerful. The, the crowd is your, it could be your social group. It could be your social strata. And if you, if you don't go with the crowd, you might be persecuted later on. So it's very important that we... I believe 
when we don't follow the crowd, the Bible is telling us, think for yourself. Think for yourself. Pay attention to what's going on. Critically think. Analyze the facts. Make a right judgment for yourself about this situation, whatever may be going on in this court. I thought this was interesting, an interesting point here in Exodus 23, 3. It says, do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. <gasps> you mean if I spill burning hot coffee on my leg, I shouldn't get a $20 million settlement? <laughs> Why would you show favoritism to a poor person? You feel sorry for them, right? The big, bad, bully corporation was mean to them. And so they should feel a sting, the punishment, you know, a big lawsuit. Yeah, yeah, get the rich guys. Get them. The Bible says don't do that. Don't show favoritism to a person just because they're poor in a lawsuit. Well, maybe they should receive a settlement. Maybe they were unjustly treated. Maybe that corporation should be punished. I don't know. But just because they're poor and the corporation's rich doesn't mean you should just always give them the settlement. Exodus 23 goes on to talk about doing good to your enemies. Suppose you have an enemy who has a, a donkey that's laden down, and this, this guy that owns this donkey hates you. Says that. And that donkey falls down in a ditch and can't get up. Get that donkey out of that ditch. Suppose you're, 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 this guy over here that hates you has a donkey that's, that's wandered out of the pen and it's, and it's lost. And you look at that donkey and you think, that's good. I'm going to lead it further away. You know? No, don't do that. Go grab a hold of that donkey. Take some time out of your personal schedule and bring that donkey back to your enemy. Didn't Jesus tell us to love our enemies? Lines up here with Exodus 23, 4 and 5. Again, here we go. This is maybe the other side of the coin. Do not deny justice to the poor. Don't condemn an honest or innocent man. These are the things the Bible tells us to do in the area of judicial favoritism. Do not accept a bribe. What happens when you accept a bribe? It changes your frame of reference for right and wrong because you've been corrupted. Because you've accepted money on one side of this argument, now you've got to butter that bread because it's buttering your bread. Excuse those expressions, but you've got, to, you've got to pay attention to that. So do not accept a bribe. Do not oppress a foreigner. The Bible says don't oppress a foreigner because you used to be a foreigner. Remember what it was like being a foreigner in Egypt? Don't treat people the way you were treated. Don't show favoritism. In Leviticus 19.15, if you want to turn over there, I welcome you to do that. It says, do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. So there's incentives, isn't there, to do the wrong thing. There's, there's, there's motives sometimes to do the wrong thing. Why would you want to, why would you want to judge unfairly? Well... You might be able to go up to that person and say, hey, I'm on the jury of your trial, and I've got the, some power to influence the discussion in the jury room about your innocence or your guilt. And if this is a powerful, wealthy person, you might go up to that person and say, will you slip me $100,000 if I can turn this case in your favor? And the guy says, well, yeah, sure, no problem. I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to go to wherever. I don't want to face the death penalty or whatever may happen to him. So justice can be perverted, and there can be partiality. And uh, what about the poor? Do the poor get a fair shake in America? They're supposed to, but I don't think they do. I don't think a public defender does as good a job as a $400,000 per hour attorney. I don't think that's fair. But that's how it is. The Bible says it shouldn't be that way. It should be fair. Our neighbors should be judged fairly. Well, let's talk about financial favoritism. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to just paraphrase this for you. Suppose a guy comes into your meetings, and he's dressed to the nines. This guy's sharp. He's got an Armani suit. He's got 
you know, custom-made alligator shoes on. He's got a, a hat. He's got a cane. He's got gold. He's, he's, this guy's obviously incredibly wealthy. And another guy comes into your meeting, and this guy's broke. He's got holes in his clothes, and he's smelly, and he hasn't brushed his hair in a month. And, I mean, this guy's in a he's breath stinky. I mean, this guy's in, a, in ba a bad way. He comes into your meeting. Do not take the guy that's dressed well and have him sit in the front seat of honor and take the guy that's dressed shabbily and have him sit at your feet or sit in the back somewhere. It says, when you have your meetings, don't do that. Don't show favoritism. Don't do this. This is inappropriate. You should treat people fairly. This is interesting. Verse 5 of James chapter 2. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Are there two sections in heaven? A poor section and a rich section? No. So just because a person doesn't have the same financial means on this side of eternity doesn't really means very little, if anything, for what has to do with their eternity. And uh, you don't want to do that. Is it, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? So at the time of this writing, the wealthy people were the ones causing the problems for the church. It wasn't the poor. And James was a little bit confused as to why you would show favoritism to a wealthy person that was harming you and hurting you. All right, point number three is, does God show favoritism? Does God show favoritism? Now, I believe God, in some senses, the word does show favoritism, but it's always for the right reasons. It's never for the wrong reasons. And... Uh, and go back to the example of, you know, you're going to hire the person to get the job in this corporation and there are 100, job, 100 applicants in only one position. Well, who do you hire? Well, you've got to show favor. You, someone's got to be better at the job than somebody else. I mean, you've got to, there's got to be some kind of criteria that you use. Hopefully, it's very objective and not so subjective, but there are objective criteria that you use to determine who gets the job, which is a favor. I'm giving you, a fa I'm giving you the job. You're the guy that got the job. So you showed the guy favor, but is it favoritism? Well, if he's the most qualified guy, it's not. But if he's my brother and he's like on a, chain, on, a, on a 100 scale, he's number five from the bottom, but he still gets the job. Now, that's wrong. That's favoritism. Well, there was, a, there was a situation where there was a guy named Cornelius in Acts. I think we're in chapter 10. And Cornelius, it's at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he starts praying. And he sees a vision of a guy named Peter. And he's staying at Simon the Tanner's house. This is some amazing prophetic detail, by the way. And, and, he, and he says, send for him. He's going to tell you something. You, you've got to send for this man you've never met, that you've heard his name or seen his face in a vision. Call for him and have him come. Three days later, who shows up at Cornelius' house? P Peter shows up. And so when Peter walks in, Cornelius, oh, Peter, he falls at his feet. <laughs> he hugs his feet. Oh, Peter, it's you. He's, hey, cut that out, man. I'm a man just like you. Don't fall at my feet. Are you kidding me? Get up. But Cornelius is, is wound up, man. He's like, whoa, God spoke to me in a vision, and this guy showed up. Then Peter says something amazing in verse 34 of Acts chapter 10. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation just any old person. No, the one who fears him and does what is right. Cornelius was a man of prayer, and he was also a giver, and he gave to the poor. And I think the angel said, when he appeared to him, he said, hey, we've heard your prayers, and we know you're giving to the poor. And that's why we're here. That's why we're showing up at your house, and not your neighbor's house. So if you want to call that favoritism, you're wrong. It's not. God chooses who he wants to choose for the right reasons. Favoritism is chewing. Chewing. No, it's not chewing. It's choosing. <laughs> help me, Lord. It's choosing the wrong people for the wrong reasons, using in inappropriate criteria. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is found in John 3, verse 16. 
For God so loved the world that He gave His only, one and only Son that whoever, say whoever, whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you will believe on the Lord Jesus, you will have eternal life. Simple. I don't, I don't care if you're male or female. I don't care if you're Jew or Gentile. If you're Asian, Caucasian, come from African descent, Antarctica, I don't care what DNA runs through your bloodstream or what level of melanin you have in your skin. It does not matter. But if you don't believe, it matters. This is the criteria that God uses. Whosoever will, says in the King James. All right, let's talk about racial favoritism because in the news today, we've had some recent cases and events that have sparked some thoughts and ideas, maybe surfaced some things that have to do with racism in America. And uh, I want to I want to talk to you a little bit about these things because I I'm I'm a glutton for punishment, I guess. I just I just want to stir my stir up things. That's just what I do. All right, so John four nine. We see a case here where there's racism or a racial tension, if you will, that's in the on the scene here in, in John chapter four. And what's happened is there's a, a woman who's a Samaritan. Now, now if you don't know what a Samaritan is, a Samaritan is a, a person from Samaria. And, and when, the, when the Israelites were brought into captivity into Assyria, the Assyrians, some of the nations, some of the folks from Assyria, went to Samaria and they intermarried with the Jewish people. Not only did they intermarry with them, but they also brought in some of their idol-worshiping customs. And so, so it wasn't just a race issue, or excuse the expression, but a ha- the half-breed issue. Uh, it was, it was a, a, a religious issue as well, because you also see the Samaritans, they're trying to stop the building of the wall in Nehemiah. The Samaritans aren't just, just, not just only racial tension, there's also historic facts that the Samaritans have done things to hinder the nation, and the Jews really have painted the whole nation of Samaria, the whole people group, with a very broad brush. And, and it's so bad that, that the Samaritan woman says, Jews do not associate with Samaritans. They had their own drinking fountain. They had their own bathrooms. This, this passage that says, uh, Jews do not associate with Samaritans, it can also be interpreted, they don't use the same dishes. We don't, we don't get too close to these people. But the amazing thing is, there's somebody on the scene that shows up that talks to them. His name is Jesus. Jesus talks to the Samaritans. He even praises the Samaritans. So Jesus himself tears down these walls. He breaks down this divide between Samaria and the rest of the nation. And he begins to build, he begins to reconcile the nations just, just by his very uh, presence and the very things that he's, he's talking to them about. I want to talk to you about Webster's definition for racism, and then I'm going to tell you I don't like it. But then we're going to move into some other stuff here. But Anyway, Webster defines racism as a belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities and that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race. That is Webster's definition for racism. Let me me define it the way I want to define it. I define it this way. Racism is showing any partiality, favoritism, or harm based in full or part simply because of a person's race. Judging people on something other than the merits or deficiencies found in their own individual behavior and character. Now I believe racism is a reality in America today. I do believe things are better, and I I could be wrong, but I think they're better than they used to be in America. I think race issues have improved, but I don't think we've arrived. I think there are still injustices in our courtrooms. I think there are still injustices in our nation. There are injustices because, somewhat, perhaps, because of race. And uh, 
But I, I want to really tackle this issue with you, and I want to really uh, get myself in trouble by doing it. Now, one thing I've noticed is that having a heightened consciousness in regard to racism doesn't seem to always give the person with this thinking a leg up in life. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean a person that's really sensitive, really sensitive about racial issues. They're always, you know, they're watching. Ah, racism! Got it, got it right there. You see that? You see that right there? Mm, bam, I found it. You know, the people that seem to walk in that hypersensitivity, I don't mean to say hypersensitivity, but real sensitivity to race issues, a lot of times it doesn't really seem to improve their lot in life unless they make it a platform. You know, and they can, they can show up on television and use that to justify their existence. But, but everyone else, what it can do, I think, is it can fuel what I would call a victim mentality. Now, what's a victim mentality? Well, I know what I think it is, but I looked it up on Wikipedia, and I want to read you what they put. A victim mentality is an acquired or learned personality trait in which a person tends to regard him or herself as a victim, victim of the negative actions of others and to think, speak, and act as if that were the case, even in the absence of clear evidence. It's all right. So, have you ever met anybody with a victim mentality? Everyone's out to get them. They, they, that's just how they think. That's the, that's the default setting of their mind. People are out to get me. Now, my, my challenge to all of us today, no matter what our race is or what our... I don't even like to use the word race. I like to say it this way. The, the percentage of melanin you have in your skin. Because I'm kind of a dark white guy. You know, I tan well. I get out in the sun, I get dark. You know, my brother back here in the back, he's got pasty white skin. He's got red hair. He's white. That guy's white. You know, but I'm kind of, you know... I, I, okay, you're not going with me on that. I'm going to stop. All right, so... Here's my point. Who do you allow to define you? Well, you, if, you're a, if you're a person with more melanin, melanin in your skin today than me, do you allow a person like me to define you? Do you allow a person like me or a person to, to tell you who you are, what kind of person you should be? Now, I believe that people are always projecting their opinion about you over you. You're never going to be able to get away from that. Everywhere you go for the rest of your life, someone's going to have an opinion about you, and it's it's going to affect the way they act around you and treat you. Now, I'm going to just, I don't know if this will be funny. I hope it is. I went out to dinner the other night with with some people, and I like to go to Colton sometimes, but I don't like to pay the bill. Anybody with me on that? You like the food, but you don't like paying the bill? So I eat peanuts, because the peanuts come free. <laughs> free, yeah. So I'm like, man, let's do this. You know, I mean, I've got it, bam, bam, I can eat peanuts like, like a madman. I'm just hammering down the peanuts. And so, so I've got, there are several people at the table, and they only gave us one little peanut shell trash can thing. You know what I'm talking about? One little bucket for the trash can peanuts. So I'm piling them up in front of me. And I've gotten to where I can't go covert any longer. My pile of peanut shells is too large, and I'm starting to draw attention, you know. And I don't want that kind of attention because I don't want to look like a glutton, you know. I don't want to look like a freeloader, a tight wad, although I probably am, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But it's too late, man. It's already happened, you know. I, hey, peanut, hey, man, he's the peanut guy, man. That guy, look at him. He can eat those peanuts. Whoa, hey, everybody, the peanut man has arrived at Colton's. Tony, right here. Oh, man, I'm trying to avoid all that attention, but I couldn't do it. So, do I allow that to define me? You know, I just had a salad and soup, you know, and some peanuts. <laughs> and several free drinks that are overpriced, you know, just on sweet tea or whatever. So... Again, the challenge is, who do you let define you? What do you allow to define you? Because if you let someone else define you, you're handing over the power of your life. And uh, I want to talk to you about uh, some of this. I believe that children are very susceptible to being defined by those over their life who have authority. What I mean by that is usually it's parents. Sometimes it's not parents. But a lot of times parents, they'll have tremendous power 
to shape the image and the internal image of a child because the child is a child. Children are hungry for affirmation. Their, their identity is, is, they don't have it. So, Daddy, what kind of person am I? Daddy, do you love me? Daddy, am I important? Daddy, am I special? Daddy, am I a beautiful princess? Daddy, am I a superstar athlete? Daddy, am I an academician? Daddy, you know, these questions are long. They're coming out of children. They want to know this kind of stuff. Now, parents, we've got a couple choices here. We can affirm our children and build up that self-image self on the inside of them, or we can say horrible things to them. We can say stuff like this. I wish you were never born, you worthless nothing. You were a mistake. Can I tell you, there are people in this room that have heard that from their parents. Can I tell you what? That hurts them. That hurts a child. That is de devastatingly painful, and it's probably the, one of the worst things that could ever happen from one person to another, an adult victimizing a child verbally. But let me ask you this. How long does this process last? Let's say I'm 13, and I'm starting to get a little rebellious because my parents are mean, and I don't like it, and so I'm struggling with rebellion, and I'm experimenting with drugs, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and ah, you know, ah. okay, now I'm 20. Now I'm 25. Now I'm 30. How long until I, I figure this out and stop blaming my parents for the person that I am at 30? Now I'm 40. Am I still a victim? I'm 45 now. Am I still a victim? It's up to you. Can I tell you, when I was 20, it hit me. I'm responsible for my life. Now, when I was 19, I was, a, I was a child. Now, I may have legally been an adult, but I'm telling you, I was not. I had no clue. I got to be in my early 20s, and I started going, oh, my goodness, you mean I'm going to graduate from college, and I'm going to have to do something? It hit me. So how long will we allow other people to define us? I get it. Children, I don't think they have much choice. They're going to be defined by the people in their life. But at some point, I think it's time we grow up. We have to take ownership of our lives and evaluate the influence we came up under and decide if we want to continue in that way or choose another path. I want to brag on a friend of mine. His name's Damon. And... Uh, Damon and I were uh, teammates at Southeast Missouri State University where we played football together. And uh, Damon was a walk if I remember right, Damon was a walk-on. And what a, what a college athlete, when, when you've got a walk-on, you've got a guy that doesn't have a scholarship. The coaches didn't recruit him. They didn't go after him. They didn't watch his high school game films. He just shows up and he says, I want to play football in college. And I've got news for you. I don't know how other colleges work, but at our college, they would accept you almost without question. But it was so difficult. It was so hard. Most people couldn't take it. And you're like, oh, come on, Pastor. No, you, you just really, if you've never played college football, you just don't really understand. Because there's a, a physical beating component that goes on in college football. You have to be a certain way to endure that. You're mentally and physically and so I, there were a lot of guys that would come out of high school just full of ideas and all that. They'd show up on the football field. They'd get knocked around for about three or four months, and then they'd quit. But not Damon. Damon shows up. He shows up uh, and talks to uh, our defensive coordinator. And he says, uh, hey, young man. You know, coach, our, that coach had a real gruff voice. He's real, he's real gravelly. You know, he's a tough, tough guy. You know, wore a, a towel around his neck. I don't know what that was about. But anyway... <laughs> He's like, uh, what's your name? And Damon says, well, my name's Damon Cannon. What? What's your name? He's like, you know, Damon Cannon, you know, like a big gun. And, and the coach says, oh, okay, big gun, come over here. He named him Big Gun, he, the nickname. Now, there's a lot of worse nicknames you could get, you know, like guns are like your arm, big guns, you know. I don't know, I thought it was a cool nickname, but he didn't like it because it was demeaning. You know, hey, big gun, get over here and pick up the dummies. Hey, big gun, come over here. Hey, big gun, take care of this. Do that. You know, he was a, he was a, 
fifth string linebacker, whatever you call that. And so I was very uh, ignorant of his situation in life until one day I looked at him. And I heard, I heard the teasing and I heard the joking. And uh, I said something to him. I said, Damon, I said, I respect you, man. I respect you a lot. Because you take a lot of abuse and you just keep going. You just, you just keep persevering and keep overcoming it. I mean, man, I mean, you guys just don't know. I mean, it was, it was a lot of verbal abuse. And even if you count, you know, hitting and all that, it's like, sort of like physical abuse because other young men, if they have a chance to master another young man on the football field, they will do it and it will be celebrated. It's not like they'll get a slap on the wrist for knocking your helmet off. They'll get a pat on the back. Well, good hit, dude. You drilled Damon. Whoa, man, look at him. He's crying. Good job. I mean, that's just the way football is. So it's rough. I'm just telling you, it's rough. And, but, but Damon had this tremendous endurance. And uh, you know what he said to me? He said, a rose by any other name is still a rose. And I, I know it's some quote from Shakespeare or something, but I remember, like, did he just say that? Who is this guy? I mean, where does this guy come from that he's got this kind of internal strength? Anyway, Damon is now a pastor in St. Louis. And uh, he's invited us up there for, in November for a, a fellowship. And uh, he happens to be a person of color. You know, he's a little darker than me. And, uh, but uh, Damon, Damon's a, a, a great guy. But Damon exemplified to me as a very young and foolish man what it was to rise above labels. To rise above what society is trying to put on you or what you perceive society is trying to put on you, no matter what it may be. And I respect him and appreciate him, and I hope he's not too mad at me for saying all the stuff I said about him. All right, so here we go. You go to a basketball game, and one team runs down, and they just get hammered. Bam! And what does the official do? He blows his whistle, he puts his fist in the air, and he points at that player and says, Foul! Number 21 on the arm! And he goes to the table and reports the foul. So then they run down to the other end of the floor, and the other team doesn't commit a foul. They just turn the ball over, the other team gets it, and they run down to the other end of the floor, another foul. Bam! I mean, it's a foul. This happens seven different trips back and forth down the floor over, you know, over the course of the first half of the first quarter. So what do the fans start yelling? Hey, ref, call it both ways. Uh, okay, is that the new rule? we got to trade fouls. Even if you don't commit one, you get one because they committed one? Is that fair? No. If you commit a foul, that's a foul. If you don't commit a foul, it's not a foul. Even if it's their refs at their gym. But what happens to the passionate parents whose child is being... in? unjustly treated in their mind. That's not fair. I'm going to get you rough after this game. I'm going to get you. You know, I mean, people go nuts at these basketball games. As a matter of fact, I went to a football game, and I was the chain gang guy, which means I'm holding the first down marker. So I get to meet the officials at a home game. They're not from Batesville. They don't even live here. They come from, they come from Little Rock. And the fans are yelling, yeah, God, you know, and it's a home game. We don't really want justice. We want our way sometimes. But you see how it happens. You get, you get a dog in the fight, so to speak. You get passionate because it's your kid out there. And, I'm going to talk to you about an idea too today. It has to do with... Uh, What makes us the way we are? What makes us the way we are? And I would break it down this way. It's nature versus nurture. Are you born the way you are? Predetermined genetically to think the way you think? To choose the choices you've made? And let me illustrate it this way. How many of you think there's a genetic predisposition for alcoholism? Anybody think that? I do. I mean, I'm not trying to bait you into something. I, I do think there's a genetic predisposition for alcoholism. I think some people are genetically predisposed to being alcoholics. Now, let me ask you a question. Does that mean that person has to be an alcoholic? No. 
Absolutely not. Why? Because they're a free moral agent. They can make choices. How many of you have ever been around somebody that the minute they touched one drop of alcohol through their mouth, they had to get slammed? I mean, they, were, they, were, they had to go full blast all the way down to the end of the road, hammered. I mean, stupid drunk. Anybody ever been around somebody like that? Yeah. Okay, but now let's say that person never touches alcohol. They're pretty good folks, aren't they? They're not nearly as crazy and belligerent as they got when they started that drinking. Can I tell you, there are people that may have a genetic predisposition for alcoholism who will never drink. And the, the expression of that horrible, life-destroying behavior will never manifest. It'll never happen because of the nurturing, the choices that have been made. So what about us? You know, there's a rumor out there that says human beings only use 10% of their brains. Now, I did a little research on this this morning because I, that's kind of what I was looking for, but I found out that's not true. I found out we use all of our brain. But that the brain is sort of like a, an engine. You know, you don't rev it to the red line 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It's, it's got reserve power, so you can, it'll take you through life. But you know, you know, full blast, you know, you're every thought firing simultaneously. That's just not how the brain works, okay? But there were two um, psychiatrists named William James and Boris Sidis in the 1890s who tested this theory. How much can we get out of a human brain? And uh, they raised uh, William, a, a young child. They say he, here in, the, in Wikipedia that he's a prodigy. But they got his adult IQ to the range of 250 to 300. Now, I, my little research this morning tells me that anything over 140 is considered, considered genius. And they say that Albert Einstein's IQ was only 160. So are you a victim of your own poor genetics? I don't think so. I think if you make up your mind to be something or do something, I think you can achieve it. I don't think there are any limitations. Now, I think people will try to put limitations on you, but you have to make a decision. Am I going to allow them to define me? If you bow your knee to the definition of another man who shouldn't be able to define you, you'll be subjugated to that man in your own mind, which is going to affect your life. But if you can say, no, you are not going to define me. I will not allow you to define me. My God is going to define me. Let God define. When God can define you, you can rise above. Any circumstances. So the idea that you only use 10% of your brain comes from William James which told his audience that people only meet a fraction of their full potential, their full mental potential, which is a plausible claim. But to say you only use 10% of your brain is really not true. I think 85 to 115 is average IQ. So when we're talking about race, are we really talking about the level of melanin in someone's skin? Are we really talking about... because? There are patterns that track with races, I believe. There are certain patterns of behavior that you can track with certain races in, if you do statistical analysis on race. But is that really the issue? Is it really the color of their skin? Is it really their genetics? Is it really their brain? Is, 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 is their brain better or worse than yours because it's just some genetic factor? Well, I believe there may, that may be a small percentage of what's going on. But I would, I would argue that the biggest percentage of what's going on is behavioral. And what I believe happens is that people learn how to think the way they think from their parents. Or society. Or the lack of a parent. Or the lack of both parents. All these things have an impact on how people think and perceive reality. So, I think the scriptures talk about the sins of the fathers being transmitted down to the third and the fourth generation. So, I believe that there is a generational thinking pattern that is in the world today. I, 
I learned how to think from my mother. I learned how to, she was my first teacher, you know. I learned a lot of things from my mother. I learned a lot of things from my father. I learned a lot of things from my stepfather and my stepmother. I learned, I learned some things from coaches and teachers along the way. But a lot of what I've learned, it, it's shaped who I am. Now, I had to make a decision, is this right or wrong? Now, I'm, I'm 40. I'm 43 years old. And, and when, when I hear the voice of my children, childhood authority speaking to me from my past, I, I, I'm old enough now to make a decision. Was Mama right? I got news for you. Mama ain't always right. How many of y'all saw the movie Waterboy? <laughs> I'm in danger, you know, I'm in danger saying that. <laughs> Mama's always right. So each culture has its own patterns of thought handed down. And I'm, I've got news for you. Those patterns are not always right. You shouldn't always embrace everything that you hear from people. Critically think. Injustices have happened throughout human history toward people of different races. It's never right, nor has it ever been right. And I, and I really think there may be an inherent distrust in people toward anything that's different from them. Have you noticed that? Yes. If it's different, oh, it's different. Uh, different might be better. Different might be worse. There are only two choices. Or the same. Three. Three choices. Now, I'm going to meddle for just a minute. But I, I feel like there's a double standard in our culture, too when it comes to the area of racism. And, uh, you know, when you look at, uh, for instance, this thing with Paula Deen, and, and let me just give you a quick disclaimer. I, I, I barely know who that woman is. I've seen her on the magazines when you're walking out of the grocery store or whatever. She's got big blue eyes and white hair, and she cooks with butter. That's all I know about Paula Deen, okay? That's it. But apparently she was on some trial. She, she got accused of being a racist, and so she was on trial, and she confessed to using the N-word 26 years ago. And the, when, when she said that, it was like, Boom! Bam! Paula Dean is pond scum. Throw her under the bus. We're never going to watch her shows. Target pulls all of her stuff. She's out the door. She is through. Her career is probably, uh, you know, she's going to be, never mind. You know, her career is totally toast. But you've got, in the same Target store, you've got gangsta rap music being sold where the N-word is not just spoken, but glorified. Is that fair? To me, that's favoritism. Now, when some people use the N-word, it can be a term of endearment to them. But I can't do that. I can't get away with that word. I can't say that. Is that fair? I don't think it's fair. I think we should abolish the word completely. Let's just get the word out of the English vocabulary. It's horrible. What it used to mean was it's horrible. It's a demeaning term to say I'm better than you, and it's it should have never been spoken. Ever. It's a horrible word. But to celebrate it over here in music, the the, the very people that were victimized by the word, that's not very wise. And no wonder why people are confused. Let's just get rid of the word altogether. That's the way my mind works. I, I don't know, but maybe I'm not. Don't think right about it. What about this? Let's say I became a magazine publisher, and uh, I decided to publish a magazine, and I'm going to name it Ivory. I'm just going to name it after my favorite color, shade of white, ivory. Would that be okay? We just talk about white stuff, white people and white issues. We don't cover anything that has anything to do with anyone remotely of any other race except for white people. Would that be okay? It wouldn't be right for anybody, I don't think. That would be horrible. That would be racism. It would be favoritism. It would be picking white people over other people. That would be wrong. And the reason you don't have that, you don't have the Ivory magazine, but you have Ebony. How does that, how does that get a pass? 
in our culture. If we want to be a post-racial America, we're going to get rid of Ebony Magazine. I don't think we make ivory. I think we just say, people. Amen. Let's just read the People magazine. I don't know anything about People magazine. It's probably ultra-liberal. Oh, gosh. I've done it and I've done it now. It's probably horrible. Right? What about, what, let's say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a high-powered tycoon, you know, and I want to start a TV network. And I name it White Entertainment Television. Are you kidding me? That would never float in America. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to avoid that, but thank you. But, but black entertainment television is okay. I don't think it should be okay. If we're going to really be fair, if we're not going to show favoritism, we're not going to play favorites, I think that should bother us. Now, I'm not against black people. I love black people. To me, black people are just white people with darker skin. And I'm just a black person with lighter skin. There's no difference. All men are created equal. I believe that. It seems like everyone wants their own favoritism. They want their own thing. I don't think it's right. As a matter of fact, I won't watch BET. I refuse to watch it. Not because I'm a racist. But because I'm not a racist. I'm not watching it. It's not fair. Favoritism should be for forbidden. Using inappropriate criteria to give favor to one person over another. Now, but let's, let's, let's break it down this way. This happens, right? There's racial inequality that goes on in America. Some of it's real. I think some of it's perceived. But I, I can't, it's too big of a problem for me to micromanage everyone's thoughts. I can't do that. But whose, whose thoughts can I deal with? Mine. You know, my best friend in high school had more melanin in his skin than I did. And when I say best, I mean best. I mean, we were together everywhere. We went everywhere together. We wrestled, we argued, we laughed, we played video games. I mean, we were high school buds. When I got to college, I was lost. And there was a young man named Aaron Layton that shared Christ with me. He also had more melanin in his skin than me. He was the best man at my wedding. And when I say I'm not a racist, I'm not. Can I give you the racist test? <laughs> if your child were to marry someone from a different race, would you have a problem with it simply because of their race? I think if you would, to quote some of our uh, comedians, you might be a racist. You know? <laughs> What's that? You might be a what? What's he say? You might be a redneck, yeah. You might be a racist. Why do I say that? Is it impossible for a person of color to love Jesus more than a person that... Is it, is it impossible for a person of color to have a better education, better training, and better career goals than a person that's Asian? Is that impossible? Of course not. It's ridiculous to think that. So to label people because of race is a mistake. Get to know people. How do they talk? How do they act? How do they live? Get to know them personally. Understand what they feel. You know, everybody wants to be heard, but nobody wants to listen. Be quiet and listen. You might learn something. Even if it doesn't make sense. That's what I do. I'll listen. I'll be like, okay, I heard you say that. And I'm processing that whole idea. It does not make sense to me, but I'm, I'm still hearing you. I know that's how you really feel, and I, and I want to respect that. I want to, I want to respect how you feel. I don't want to be mean or, or you know, cruel or anything like that. But this morning, God doesn't see color. He sees hearts. He was little David, you know. He just saw, you know, yeah, he's little, but I see his heart. I think we should be like God. I think it's a challenge sometimes to see beyond our prejudices, to see beyond our experiences. You know, I knew, I knew a guy who was, uh, 
a white guy who was gang raped in prison by black men. He had racial problems. But do you blame him? Is it okay? It's not okay. But what happened to him had an impact on his life. Now to say, hey, that shouldn't have any impact on your life, you go, well, wait a minute, time out. That's, that was a horrible, that was trauma, that was traumatic, that was a horrible thing. But can I tell you what, this is, I, mean, I hate to even talk this way at church, but white guys can do the same thing. It's got nothing to do with color. It just happened to be guys of color that did that to him. Can we let God define us today? You know what? There's a spirit in America that wants to divide us. And my challenge to you today is, will you bow your knee to that principality that says, this man can't be my friend? I can't understand him. He can't understand me. There's racial things that are just insurmountable. Class warfare is a strategy of the devil. It's a strategy of the enemy. It's, it's worked throughout history to destroy civilizations. It's not happening to me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not believing it. I'm not going for it. Father, in Jesus' name, God, we thank you for the body of Christ, and we thank you for the world. You've taught us to pray for the world, to love the people in the world, not to love what they do, but to love them. And This morning, God, in Jesus' name, I ask you to make sense of this word, make sense of these, this concept of favoritism. God, help me not to play favorites because of anything, not to choose or not choose, not to, not to be stereotypical not to be biased because of things that aren't fair, things that aren't true. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for our great country. Lord, I ask you to cause us as a nation to come together and uh, be prepared for the things that are coming on our land because we're going to need one another. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy and kindness in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I bless you this morning. I thank you for being here today. If you'd like to talk, I'd, I'd love to talk, and uh, as you can tell, and uh, I'll be available uh, after church to discuss anything with you. And we'll see you Wednesday night or Sunday morning. God bless you.